Step three, you grow hard about what you want to be. Step four, fuck everybody, just do your thing. Wake up, today's gonna be a good day. Wake up, today's gonna be a good day. Wake up, today's gonna be a good day. Wake up. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Tales from the Field. My name is Bradley Ball, and it is so good to have you with us. If this is your first time joining us, we are over here on the hub of Tales from the Field on our YouTube channel. Uh, give us a like, give us a subscribe. We drop content every Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. On Monday and Wednesday, we have our MS Tech Fits. On Tuesday, we have our Azure Data Community Roundtable. But today is a special day. We have with us uh, Mona Whelan from the Azure Open AI Product Group. Mona, it's so good to have you with us. Uh, we also have Alex Morales. Uh, we have Karen Eckberg. Uh, we have uh, Andreas Padilla. Andreas seems to have, have dropped out on me. Um, I think we're having some technical issues with Andreas, but hopefully we will have Andreas back soon. And of course, uh, there's the word spectacular, but you can't spell that without Naraj Jafari. He's your friend of mine and he is here and he is wonderful. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. So this is very, very exciting. What we're doing is we're talking specifically about the Azure AI, uh, the Azure Open AI Assisted API, Assistant API launch. Um, th this is going to be just a fantastic show where we're going to take us through this. Mona is going to talk to us about exactly what this is. She's going to break this down to us. There's some very exciting things that our Fast Track team has done. Um, Alex, Naraj, Andreas, and we've got many different team members that have contributed to the AI in a box. Uh, our good uh, teammate, Gene Hayes. Uh, Marco is also a big part of that. Then uh, I saw that uh, Kate had also uh, participated and included some wonderful stuff about responsible AI. Uh, we've got a whole lot of great safe jam packed. And then my favorite PM in all of Fast Track, Karen Eckberg, is here. And she's going to talk to you about how you actually engage with the team. So maybe we can work on some of this great technology that Mona's going to tell us about today together. Uh, so excited uh, for this. And so let's go ahead and let's kick things off. Um, maybe let's do a quick round of introductions and we'll go around the horn. Uh, Alex, I see you first up on my right. I'm going to start with you and then uh, we'll go around to Mona and then we'll hit Karen, Naraj, and Andreas. Um, of course, uh, Andreas and Naraj probably need no introduction. People know them. They're part of Tales from the Field. It's old hat. Uh, but uh, <laughs> Alex, talk to us. Tell us what you, you do over at Microsoft for uh, Fast Track and, and what are you doing? Yes. Uh, hi, guys. Hi, Bradley. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Alex Morales. I'm actually a manager in our um, Azure Fast Track uh, apps team. At Fast Track, we are divided into a few teams like infrastructure, core, data, you guys, and the apps team. I represent the apps team. I've been with Microsoft uh, 12 years now, and I am very happy to be here, and I look forward to sharing with you some of this amazing technology. That's some good stuff. Thank you so much, sir. And congratulations on those 12 years. That's fantastic. And uh, and so, of course, we we have uh, Mona Lisa Willen. And Mona, I, I was going to say, uh, I I did not realize your name was Mona Lisa until I connected with you on uh, uh, on LinkedIn. And I absolutely love that name. That is not used enough in this world. Uh, for, I can't unmute you. I think you're going to have to unmute yourself. But but please tell us, tell the folks who you are and also what you do for Microsoft. Yeah, I get that reaction a lot, but I, I say that it, it was the best branding exercise through my name that my grandmom, you know, did for me. But everyone calls me Mona, so I'm Mona Whelan. I am a principal PM with uh, the Azure OpenAI team, and currently I'm leading product for Assistance, Assistance API, and I'm going to tell you all about it, how it's changing the world of creating co-pilots and you know, sharing my insights with you on what we've learned from the field, working with this team, and we had the launch last week. So super excited uh, about everything. I've been with Azure OpenAI for a little close to a year now, and it's been like super exciting uh, a journey. Um, and I've been on a, a number of products, so this is my latest one that I'm excited to talk to you about. Congratulations. We are so, so excited about this. Uh, and, and then I see my good friend, Karen Eckberg. Karen, please talk to the good folks about what it is that you do at Microsoft. So thank you. A privilege to be here. I'm a program manager with the Fast Track organization. A privilege of working with these awesome engineers and our product group with Mona. I've been here for four years and Microsoft all up for 13. So it's getting up there, but happy to be here today. 
Wonderful, wonderful. And then uh, I was going to say, uh, Naraj, uh, the great Bambino, uh, the man known for so many things in so many places by so many people. Uh, uh, great, great to see you again, buddy. Uh, and Andres Padilla, uh, the man with the best beard in the business. I don't know if you guys want to introduce yourself. You don't need to. Uh, the, the folks should know you from Tales we, from the Field. Yeah, we can start off, I think. Yeah, you got uh, it. Only, so, only thing I want to add is uh, Alex makes a mean barbecue. On top of being the go-to man for open AI, the barbecue's off his charts. I was yeah. going to say, I, be I believe it. So Alex, of course, is a, is a Florida native as well. And uh, the last time we got together, it was it was pre-COVID and it was over at Disney Springs. But it's always a good time when you get Alex involved. Yeah. So Mona, I say, I've, I've I got... The same about you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I've got you up first. So um, I, I think... People want to know. Uh, maybe we do an overview. What is the Azure uh, Assist Azure OpenAI Assistant API? Yeah, so it's a new product offering from uh, from the Azure OpenAI service, and this is something that has intrigued and excited uh, you know developers all over the world who are working with copilots. So the best way to think about assistance is essentially an evolution of the chat completion API. So what we've been seeing in the industry is that you know we started off with a, you know a year back with chat completions and over time uh, we've been adding layers of complexity and improvements in tooling to make copilots more powerful. So you know where initially we had this idea of you know assistance or we, you know like uh, chat assistance that you can create with a prompt. Then we add uh, added data to create a retrieval augmented generation. Then we start providing tools and function calling. And now we have this avatar of assistance, which has all of that and so much more wrapped in a stateful API, which is the first of its kind from Azure OpenAI. And it enables a ton of use cases that were not available before, or you know, ones that you could possibly implement, but uh, it would take a lot of time to produce something that sophisticated. That sounds fantastic. Now, I know you have some slides. Would you like me to, to share those? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And let's share with sound because I would like to start off with a video showing you what assistance is about. So I, I don't know if you shared your screen, if you enabled this sound on the screen share. If you did when you shared your screen, then the, the audio should come through. Okay. Let me reshare. No problem. And Josh Ludeman, hey, I know that Alex guy. Absolutely. Our good buddy, Josh Ludeman. Thank you so much for watching out there. We appreciate you. Uh, Daniel Taylor, love this team so much and looking forward to hearing the announcements from Mona and from Alex. Absolutely. Thank you, Dan. Uh, the Data Mutiny is on board. Always great to see the Data Mutiny. Yay. Uh, and then uh, early on, uh, Zeo Lu, uh, they, were, they were very excited. Uh, gave us a great comment before we even got to the live stream. Um, I, I can't wait either. Uh, so let's go ahead. Let's, I'm going to reshare this and let's go ahead and see if the video audio comes through. Let's do it. Let's move to slide three. Introducing Assistance API, a new feature in Azure Open AI service. Discover the future of building intelligent, dynamic, GPT-powered AI assistants within your applications. Leverage the latest GPT models, define custom instructions to tune the model's behavior, and leverage tools and knowledge to respond to user queries. Incorporate external data like product specs and sales data in multiple file formats using knowledge retrieval. Code Interpreter writes and executes code on the fly and performs advanced data analysis in a sandboxed environment. Function Calling connects your assistant with external APIs and lets the model smartly decide when to use those functions based on a prompt's context. You can even store and access conversation history with threads to preserve context, even through lengthy interactions. Build the next-gen AI app for your organization and bring cutting edge this is amazing. Oh, wow. Did that get paused? Wow. Yeah, I, I think that I think that paused. Let me, let's see, go ahead and put us over here. I think it pulled out of the video on us. Oh, I'm sorry for that. 
Uh, no, that's okay. I was going to say what we saw was absolutely incredible. Now I've, I've had to do some of these things um, over Microsoft Fabric where we're using Copilot to be able to uh, generate code in notebooks and things of that nature. Um, and, and all the guys are, are checking their bingo list because yes, I have managed to get Microsoft Fabric into the conversation, um, even though we're, we're doing open AI, but that's okay because uh, Fabric Copilot is using open AI resources underneath the covers. So this is absolutely amazing stuff. I, as someone who has written many different codes and formats, when you learn one language, it gives you that capability to go, okay, I know how to do this essentially. I need to make these variables. I need to make this function call, but I not, may not know this new language. How do I get this to translate? This does an amazing job of being able to shortcut that process, but there's so much more to that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and it's interesting you, you said fabric because for for an API like this, which provides the level of flexibility that it does, you know, it could be you know anything from making your development time minimal, getting uh, reaching you where your data is, where your indexes are, which is currently not a part of uh, assistance, but something you know is is uh, is something that we, we are interested in learning about and exploring in the future. But like all of that is just uh, you know makes it really powerful and exactly in line with what you said. Yeah. Josh said, Brad got a bingo. I, I did, I did with Microsoft fabric. I did. And, and it, you're absolutely right. One of the thing, great things we're doing at Microsoft, we're bringing these AI assistant features to you where you live, where you want to be. So that way you don't have to pick and choose with, Oh, I use this product, but it doesn't have this. We're making this accessible across the board, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, so when I, when I look at these assistants, I, I see your slide here. We've got uh, build stateful assistance faster. Now, could you talk to me about that? What does that mean, building a stateful assistant? Yeah, so when you think about um, what state essentially encompasses, and I would say that it includes an ability for the model, and in this case, you know, it could be the latest GPT-4 Turbo, 3.5 Turbo models, to understand and manage conversation state, right? And these are things like, you know, hey, let's say, you know, if you think about the paradigm of, of a conversation between a user and a, and a co-pilot, that state is no is was not stored uh, within the API or the API didn't have a knowledge of that until assistance made it happen. So the ability for for your uh, assistant or your co-pilot to understand state to draw from the context of that is what makes a, a stateful assistant. And think about it, about how it could extend to not just one conversation where you have one user talking to one assistant, but also the ability in the, in the future, or I would say like even today, for different assistants to talk to each other because it has the concept of, uh, you know, the reference to the thread and the messages within a thread that it could, you know, understand, absorb, and then use it to inform future uh, responses to the user or to each other um, within a system. That's fantastic. And so that, I mean, that's critical, right? In people being able to create that virtual assistant. I always like to think of Jarvis, like in Tony Stark and Iron Man, um, as, as you can see from the background, not a comic book fan whatsoever. Um, but uh, I always like to think about how they have those conversations, how we actually build technology like that. Uh, Mahit Bashin said, I see assistants can retrieve and use files how should I think about this feature compared to Azure Cognitive Search that allows us to be able to do the same? It's a very interesting question. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So um, one thing to note here is that Assistance is using the retriever tool, which uses Azure Cognitive Search underneath. So it is powered by the same technology uh, that you would like if uh, that you would otherwise use, right? What assistance makes it easy is that you know you are no longer having to do everything that you need to implement uh, an RAG solution, which means you're not having to uh, create uh, embeddings and store them somewhere, implement vector search, etc. All of that is taken care of by the assistance API. So uh, right now the experience is as simple as you just you you know uh, add the files to the assistant. And everything gets taken care of uh, behind the scenes. Interesting. And so, and so just a, a, and again, I I am a very simple man, so I like to keep it simple. Uh, you you referenced RAG R A G 
Uh, mm -hmm. Could you tell me what that is for, for people who might not be uh, familiar with that term? Yeah, so RAG is essentially a, an implementation or a cognitive architecture where you have the model, uh, you have a chat completions model, for example, you know, the LLM, and it has the knowledge of the external world, right, based on the training data that it has received. Now, what if you want that model to be able to respond to questions that are related to or specific to a, a certain entity or a certain paradigm, which is private knowledge, for example, right? And this could mean it could be, uh, if you're a company, it could be documents related to your company that are not public knowledge, or it could be maybe, uh, you know, you even have publicly available web pages, but you're trying to modulate the direction of the responses from the model so that it responds from the, the knowledge base that you wanted to answer from while using the powers of, you know, the, the, uh, the LLM underneath, which, uh, you know, makes it more flexible. So the basic use cases of, of, of RAG are, you know, uh, companies looking to, let's say, an HR use case, if you're building an internal company chatbot, you would want to, uh, you know, give your model uh, documents and files of, you know, insurance coverage for your employees, employee policies, you know, everything that you think you would need to build an HR chatbot, you put it. And what it does is the, the answer that that uh, assistant or co-pilot starts giving are specific to that model while uh, including the verbosity and the skills of the LLM lying underneath. Absolutely. The the uh, the retrieval augmentation generation, but it really gets down to that proprietary data, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna go back to Iron Man because again it's simple. But when it when he says to to Jarvis, play, uh, plot me a flight path uh, from here to here. Uh, they're using telemetry that they have based off of the knowledge they have of his suit to be able to go, how fast is it going to go? Where, what's the, the route that I'm going to take? But that's his own data that it's doing kind of that retrieval augmentation generation to be able to generate that type of thing. Or when he says, hey, read all these files and give me a summary. Um, yeah. That's what we're talking about is, is using your own data, using that private, um, uh, I, I guess, the private components that make up your company yeah. To be able to say, help me understand how these things connect, and of course, AI can do that in a way that is is much faster and can often connect things that we could miss uh, from a pattern point of view as as humans. So, yeah, very 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 cool stuff. Um, I absolutely love it. No, please please tell me more. Yeah, so I mean, one thing that I, that I think makes it really sort of like easy to understand and bring home is that. All of these ways that we're talking about, you know, uh, you know, whether it's RAG or you know, the video showed you some of the tools that an assistant has, like Copilot. These are all ways of extending the capabilities of the model so that it adapts to the task uh, to your task at hand. It reduces overall hallucination of the system, and it provides you know the right kind of output in the right with the right kind of context. So whether it's RAG, adding your data, adding multiple tools, adding something like function calling that enables you to call uh, multiple APIs in parallel, all of these are ways for you to, I, I call it like increasing the intelligence of your co-pilot system. I love it. You know, it's it's funny. And again, this will probably be my last Marvel reference. I know, bingo card, right? Uh, but a long time ago in, in uh, one of the Avengers movie, he said, Jarvis is my co-pilot. I actually have that on t-shirt and it's so funny because I wore it to something we did the other day we and somebody was like, <laughs> yeah. I, and, so, and somebody was like, Oh yeah. The co-pilot. And I, I, I went, wow, that takes on a whole new meaning now that it did just a few years ago. That's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, ultimately if it reaches like the Jarvis level of intelligence, I would say my job is done. <laughs> yeah. yeah uh, Josh says bingo. Um, and then Dan says, I, I'm pretty sure what he meant to say is it won't be the last reference to Marvel. Dan, you're probably right. You know me well. Um, but no, let's, uh, so uh, as as we look at this, um, is there more that you want to you wanna tell us about? I know you've also got a really cool demo, but mm -hmm. I don't want to rush you off of uh, talking about the system. I'm absolutely fascinated by this, and it seems to be just so unbelievably cool. Yeah, let me give you sort of like a, a primer in, um, you know, a lot of it was sort of like touched upon on, on the video, but uh, I want to talk about sort of like, what's the benefit to you as a developer if you're working with something like Assistant? So you already have 
you know, the best in class models from Azure OpenAI. Uh, you know, there's other ways that you can architect and, and build, uh, you know, stateful agent. But there's this notion of intelligent orchestration that is, that can be like hard to achieve and make, uh, which kind of, you know, can impact your overall development time, your the time to market for your app. So assistance with, uh, you know, all of the things that you're seeing on the screen, right, from thread and memory management, retrieving and using files and, you know, taking the pain out of, you know, uh, 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 implementing a full vector search solution, uh, uh, adding functionality like code execution is now super simple. You just need to enable code interpreter as a tool and uh, it writes and runs a Python code uh, and solves complex math problems iteratively. And all of this, you know, is done in a sandbox environment. So there's that added layer of security uh, around code execution. A lot of our customers actually love uh, Code Interpreter because it just does tremendously well in analyzing reams and reams of data, uh, complex data, and coming up with data visualization and just making uh, it easy for you know even teams of data analysts who are just looking for easy ways to get insights without you know. Uh, uh, digging through Excel or, or working through uh, different types of files, and with function calling, uh, you know, this is this is one of the interesting ones. The ability for you know, there was this concept of plugins that came in sometime last year, which was a way to again, like a way to extend your model's abilities by let's say connecting into the internet. So you have the idea of web browsing through Bing, uh, and there are like several others uh, that uh, we and OpenAI launched. So the function calling is, is, the, is the next avatar of this, which provides uh, developers more flexibility in how uh, the model uh, orchestrates and, and uses uh, uh, the data from external APIs. So function calling is, is inbuilt within assistance, but the keynote is uh, that assistants don't themselves have the ability to call functions. Uh, but you have an ability to define the function and then the model has the intelligence to call the function based on the context that you've given it through, you know, it could be your instructions, which is the meta prompt. It could be all of the other things that, you know, happen in the thread. So there is this part that is, that is really, really new when with the system, it makes it super simple. And that along with, you know, our best in class safety systems, responsible AI tools, all of that is a, a part of assistance, which makes it basically ready for you to uh, develop an assistant like this fast and get it to market. Absolutely. There's, there's two things you said right there, and I, I want to make sure we don't skip over them. So for, first off, for security, right? The fact that everything is brought up in its own sandbox. I mean, that that's massive. And, and for anybody who hears the term sandbox who doesn't fully understand it, what we're talking about is a walled off set of compute and storage that is inaccessible um, from the outside of that, other than the API connection that you have directly connected to it. So whatever you're generating there to be able to look at, um, there's not a capability that that is accessible in any way, shape or form to anyone else. Um, so from a security perspective, that's absolutely massive. That allows you to be able to iterate and also experiment without fear of where is the data being stored? How is it going to be accessed by others? Um, it, it gives you a really nice safety environment to be able to, to work in. The second is these functions, because it sounds like what we've got is the capability to have kind of a, a program behavior or a function call, essentially, that would have a set of code instructions behind it or, or have some type of mechanism. So if I was constantly saying, hey, give me, you know, Microsoft stock price or, or get me what my weather is going to be, um, you know, or here's the preparations for uh, um, when I'm in Florida. So it so is Andreas and uh, Alex, you know what's the preparation for hurricane season? And then, you know, hey, I see something's coming. I don't need to remember. It can go, hey, make sure you do this. We're gonna uh, check these locations, look at the the television, the radio, here's this, is there a vaccination area? But it looks like we can make those behaviors, we can call them. So here's that preset defined so you can begin to actually say things like, I want you to go get this on a regular basis. And it's going to understand what you're talking about and it's going to do a repeatable process that um i, I think I, I love the term that you said earlier uh, data hallucination right uh it prevents it from going way outside and doing something in a creative fashion that you weren't necessarily working looking for but it gives you that steady and constant feedback of i'm gonna do this 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 and this when you when you say it yeah 
Yeah, and it's, wow. it's this, yeah, it, it is this control as well as sort of like intelligence of orchestration and both of them coming together is I think what, what the industry is heading towards just in terms of exploration, right? But also the, uh, the need for both deterministic and non-deterministic outputs and systems that enable them to coexist so that they, uh, you know, there, there is like, you know, we say something for everyone and something for every use case need not be one or the other. Absolutely. Fantastic. So yeah. I, and I, I was going to say, I'm mo monopolizing bonus time, but uh, Alex, Andreas, uh, uh, Taraj, Karen, if you have anything that you want to uh, highlight or feature, please let me know. Uh, but Mona, I, I want to let you continue on. I see that we've gone to another uh, comparison now from chat compilation APIs versus assisted API. Yeah. And this is in line with what I was talking about yesterday, we often get a lot of questions, right? Around like, is this a new API? How is this different? And I think, uh, you know, side by side comparison makes it easy. But because as you can see, like the primitives of both the APIs are entirely different. Where with chat completions, there was an idea of messages or, you know, uh, sort of like the multi turn conversation that happens between the model and, uh, you know, the user. And then you perform a completion task. Uh, you know, with with one of uh, the OpenAI LLMs, right? It is lightweight, it is powerful, it is flexible, but it is stateless, which means that as a developer, there's like all of these other, you know, tasks that you have to execute on your side. So with assistance, you're kind of like turning that on its head. We're saying, okay, we enable primitives that enable all of these things that enable the state for this, which is essentially the conversation state. In addition to that, what if we provide you an ability to do all of these tasks, which is like defining tools, retrieving documents, executing code, just something as simple as, you know, you turn the toggle on and, and it's there for you, right? And um, I foresee that in the future, there'll be not only uh, Azure OpenAI uh, uh, hosted tools, you know, we have the code interpreter and knowledge retrieval, which is coming soon uh, to our service, but also, uh, you know, uh, expanding to more uh, native tools uh, from our side, as well as function with function calling, you can basically go up to 108 tools per assistant as of today, connect to different APIs, different tools that you've created. And think about how powerful that can make your assist one assistant to be able to achieve different tasks. And then, you know, if you have a way to uh, define different assistants, you know, we've been hearing from some of our customers that, you know, there's, uh, you know, an experiment with, I want to have an assistant that is specialized in a particular domain, who talks to an assistant, uh, who works in a different domain, and then they collaborate to solve a user problem. And all of this is enabled through a thread and state management, through enabling different tools and different models based on, you know, what do you want an assistant to be capable of in your system? Fantastic. I think you probably answered part of the question, but uh, Mo Bahin uh, comes back again and he says, when do you suggest using function calls versus code interpreters? Since a code interpreter could also get the Yahoo stock price, right? So code interpreter does not. Code interpreter, because it's in a sandbox environment, it, it is only able to act on the data or the, or the files that you upload on it. Or if you're not using a file, you can ask it to solve a math or a code problem. The only way that you can augment uh, outside data from it, if it is, you know, augmentation through files you added, you have knowledge retrieval. If the information you need, like getting a stock price, includes calling an API, it is only available through function calling. You can't do it through code interpreter. Having said that, there are use cases that you can enable code interpreter and function calling together, and they can work in tandem to answer questions that might need inputs for both. And you know, when you execute that, you'll see the different steps uh, that uh, the um, the assistant is using, you know, uh, to get the information, how it's informing the next task, sort of like a chain of command in a uh, way. And, you know, you are able to do that together. But for uh, like getting the stock price, you, you know, I have a demo where, you know, we call the Yahoo Finance uh, API to get the latest stock price for Microsoft. And you can do the same. Oh, very uh, nice. Very uh, nice. Uh, yeah. I um, I have a couple of examples of this, but I'm gonna let Mona show her example. But we, I'll I'll try to go into some of these detail when 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 and if we will have time to give these examples. Absolutely, uh, Edward Noriega, our, our good friend over on the Fast Track product group, uh, says good stuff. 
Uh, Mo says, thank you for the answer. Uh, great questions, Mo. Keep them coming. We really appreciate them. Yeah. And, and back over to you, Mo. No, I, I see we're now at uh, how assistants work. Yeah, I'm going to skip over a few slides and I think it's, uh, you know, move to the demo as fast as I can. So, you know, essentially the way assistants work is a six step process, uh, which you can see on the screen. So the first thing is, you know, you create an assistant and what you need to create an assistant is uh, some of it is optional, actually. But you give an assistant a name, you give it some instructions, uh, which this is a finance advisor chatbot. And, um, you know, this is like put your prompt engineering skills to best use. And we have some really good guidelines in our Microsoft Learn documentation. You pick the model you want to use with it, and then you optionally upload files or enable tools. So once you've done that, you know, you start creating something called a thread, which is step number two. So thread is a conversation between a user and an agent, or it could even be a conversation between an agent and an agent if you're creating a multi-agent system. So you don't do anything specific to create a thread. As soon as you start talking to the assistant, you'll get a thread ID that gets auto-generated for reference in other threads or reference in the future. And this is something that stays in the system until you delete it, right? So uh, the thread keeps like adding and the messages keep getting appended to it as the conversation keeps going on. So that is step two and step three. So once you think that the assistant has gathered enough context of what it needs to do to uh, give you back the response. You perform the step of running the assistant, and this is, uh, you know, you, you do specifically, and uh, you know, when you run the assistant uh, on on the OpenAI Azure OpenAI Playground, you can basically see the logs or the steps of how uh, an assistant is being run. So you'll see that you know it. Uh, uh, the different run steps, the status of the run, which is step five, is it running, is it expired, is there something wrong with it? So there's a little bit of diagnostic and debuggability uh, insight into what's going on behind. And then once all of this is done, uh, it displays uh, the assistant response. And then you know it, the whole cycle happens over and over again every time you, um, you prompt it with, uh, with a question. So this is like overall and uh, you know how like one cycle of uh, an assistant user or an agent assistant assistant response cycle works but uh, you know all of this combined with everything that that exists within this interaction is is, uh, is saved uh, uh, behind the endpoint and that is what enables the statefulness of the assistants fantastic cool Okay, quick glimpse on uh, you know travel up example. We'll not go a lot into it because we have a few demos, but basically this is an example of how somebody could implement uh, a, a personalized travel app powered by the Assistance API. So you have a customer who's looking for travel booking or travel planning help. You create an assistant. This could be like the main assistant that talks to the customer. We call it the user proxy agent, and you can potentially also create other assistants who are specialized in certain verticals. Let's say you have a train booking specialist, you have somebody who is specialized in Airbnb bookings, et cetera. So there's like, this is one way of orchestrating it. It's not the only way, but this is just as an example. So for this example, I've enabled, uh, you know, um, certain tools that are configured with these assistants. So there's code interpreter and knowledge retrieval that the main assistant has configured with. And then for function calling, uh, there's this live train schedules app from uh, this German train company. And to read and out to write to Outlook, you can use the Graph API, or there's also like ton of other ways like logic, logic apps, et cetera. And yeah, so you know, uh, you create the assistant exactly as I had mentioned earlier. And then these are examples of some queries of uh, you know how uh, a conversation can work between you know this group of agents and the customer. And you know, it's everything from you know, they ask you to suggest a day-by-day -day itinerary. The assistant retrieves the files, uh, you know, which was basically their their flight plan and gives you the answer. So this is an example of a RAG implementation. Then the second one is, you know, can the assistant block my calendar for the dates of Oktoberfest? So the assistant looks up uh, uh, the itinerary for the music festival date by making a function call to, uh, you know, if it's the Oktoberfest website or maybe this detail is in your... Uh, in your document, you know, that's again like an example of intelligent orchestration, whatever is fast for it to get. And then calls the Microsoft Graph API to create an Outlook event in your calendar with the dates of October 1st blocked out. 
And then the uh, next one is, you, you know, what if uh, I want this assistant to, to do some complex math? So we, we know that traditionally, uh, you know, LLMs are not as good at solving code and math problem, but, you know, we have code interpreters. So in this case, I, uh, you know, the user asks, you know, hey, this is my Airbnb bill for, you know, and the four of us are staying, can you help me split my bill? So it does the calculation, it generates a Python code and then answers the question. So this is like not even touching the tip of the iceberg on how powerful code interpreter is, but it's just to show you that this is a capability or an enhancement over LLM. And then the last one is, um, what if a user wants to know the latest, most up-to-date information on the, on the connections between two cities for a particular date, and then also needs help in deciding based on his travel itinerary, what is the cheapest uh, train ticket that he can get. And uh, the assistant calls the DB API, gets this information, does a calculation and comparison of what are the, uh, uh, you know, based on the timings and, you know, the trade-offs with the cost, what are the options and helps the user make an informed decision. So this is sort of like an example of, uh, you know, how using different tools and functions in parallel, how you can basically have like a way to create a personalized experience for your users. Excellent, wonderful. So, and I, I know you've got a demo to be able to walk us through. Yeah. Is there a demo that you want to run through? Yeah, let me switch my screen. I want to make sure we have enough time. No problem. And I, I know we, we started a little bit late. We, we can go a little bit over. I know uh, folks might have different time constraints, but one of the things I do want you to remember is that the recording of this stream is in the exact place where you are watching the live stream. So if for some reason uh, you end up having to leave or you've got to come back to it, this is the exact same lo location. Uh, we're going to have this up on Tales from the Field as well. This is in our um, our playlist specifically where we, uh, we look at OpenAI uh, and we look at uh, ML components. Mirage and Andreas has some videos there. I have some videos there. Uh, on how we've worked with different service components. So um, I'm going to go ahead and add your screen back to the stage. Uh, Julio Minya uh, asks, what is the difference between this GPT and, that OpenAI provides in its enterprise version of ChatGPT? I see. So you're asking about the OpenAI GPTs and possibly what's the difference with, with assistance. So it's interesting because... Uh, GPTs are actually powered by Assistance API under the hood. And uh, the way you work with GPTs is, you know, it's, it's like a separate target audience. It's, uh, it's an ability for you if you're, if you're a user of the consumer chat GPT app and, you know, you're a low code, no code user, right? You don't want to touch code, but you want to create assistance for your or, you know, uh, uh, for your own use case or, or for other people's use cases but uh, you want to do it in a fast and easy way. So if you've tried out creating GPTs, it's essentially similar functionality to what we provide with Assistance API. But the difference is Assistance API is better for developers who want to um, configure their assistance beyond the basic capabilities of what you get with GPT, which means if you want to create something specific to your enterprises, right, which means enhance security guardrails, maybe you want better access controls, maybe you want to add tools that are specific to your enterprise, right? And, and not something that's publicly available. So with assistance, it provides you that flexibility and configurability that GPTs doesn't have. Um, and yeah, like I've created GPTs, uh, so has my mom. She has uh, 10 GPTs, um, you know, that she shows off to me every other weekend. And uh, it's, it's just, it's very, very accessible. It's a tremendous product. And, uh, I encourage like anyone to go ahead and use GPTs and see what are the different ways you can augment. But underlying models, you know, are the same models and and uh, the architecture behind it as you know the services that are used under the tools that are used under are are the same as assistants. No, that's great to know, and and that's fantastic. I love it that your mom uses it too. My dad does. As a matter of fact, my dad wrote my mom's anniversary card using uh, ChatGPT, and and she's reading it. And all of a sudden, you can see how touched she is, and she starts to cry. And my dad goes, "I wrote it with ChatGPT," and I was like, "Dad, I would have kept that secret to the grave. I, I would not have admitted that." Her her face visibly changed. She was no longer crying afterwards. Uh, but yes, no, GPTs are amazing. But if you need that functionality from a developer to be able to get that enhanced functionality, 
that's exactly why you would use the assisted um, API. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 more configurability, it's more flexibility. If you like like to work in a code environment, it's better for you. So there's all of that uh, that I think is, is like first passes. But I'm on the assistance playground on OpenAI Studio. So last week we launched the API uh, for this. Uh, we have SDK support, and then we launched on the OpenAI Studio. Sometime in the next 10 days, this will also show up on the Azure AI Studio, which is something we launched uh, at Ignite with essentially a similar functionality. But, the, uh, but what I'm going to show you today is what is live today on the assistance playground. So there's essentially three parts to this experience. One is you know the assistant setup, which is what I showed you earlier. You name the assistant, you provide some instructions, you provide a deployment, a deployed uh, model, and then you know optionally you can add some functions here. We provided some example functions of like getting weather and getting a stock price, but you can also define your own. Then uh, you can enable code interpreter. You can add some files, and it's like very simple. You, we have uh, several five ty file types that are supported uh, with Code Interpreter today, and you know uh, there's a link to this that I can share afterwards. But you know it's just as simple as just dragging and dropping from your system, and it gets added here. So yeah, so uh, let's see if I can open something uh, from before. So I created this one, which is sort of like a data analyst assisted, and it's going to analyze some financial data. And what I've given it is this file of uh, you know stock market information it's from Nifty 500, which is uh, an Indian stock market, and has all of this information. And I'm going to ask uh, it to analyze, do some analysis on on this file. And then uh, you know there's some functionality that is not yet supported, and that is related to function execution on uh, the playground yet. So that is coming. So that I'll show you in another uh, tool. So yeah, so this is like the main chat session, and um, and then there's this panel for you to see the logs or like the six step process that I was showing you earlier. So let's see what it says if I say hello. So as you can see, it's you know it created a thread ID. It's showing you all of the steps that's running behind the scenes. You can see you know the request response format. You know that it created a message, it ran the thread, and then you know it, it also gives me all the run steps here. So you can see all the steps like status, was it canceled, was it completed, was it expired, was it failed? So it ensures that debuggability. So let's see if I ask it something like, what are the top five revenue generating companies? The data. And this is like a very simple example because um, code interpreter can do something way more sophisticated. So I encourage you to try this out. I see there's a typo there, but I hope it's still going to work. Yeah, I was going to say the wonderful thing is, and I have found this, I, I am dyslexic and I am a terrible typer. Uh, uh, spell check is my friend. But mm -hmm. often when I type things out, I have been amazed at the number of times where uh, sometimes I'll repeat something accidentally, or sometimes I uh, I type something wrong. It does a really good job of trying to find, well, actually figuring out what I meant, even though I, I asked it completely wrong. So yeah. uh, that's one thing I found to be rather amazing about the models. While we're sitting here waiting, uh, first off, uh, uh, Julio uh, Minga says, thank you. Uh, Mo had asked a question. Mo had asked, is the code for uh, this travel app shared somewhere? I know that was an example you were giving. Um, yeah. and what we shared was we shared some of the links for Azure open AI in the box. Um, and we're going to, we're going to get to the example of those, but, um, here's where you can find some of the examples, aka.ms slash assistance dash API dash N dash a dash box. Um, and then AI dash N dash a dash box, uh, for aka.ms. So that way you can get to the code repository that the team has put together over on GitHub uh, with examples as well. And then um, we had another question. Let me go ahead and pop that up because uh, I, I lost your screen. But before we get that back, so Brian Ha said, will assistance support streaming similar, similar to the OpenAI implementation? Yeah, so th that is on uh, the roadmap. That is in the plan, so you should be able to see it soon. Excellent, excellent. Thank you. Great question, Brian. 
Um, thank you, Mona, again. Uh, and so I've, I've reshared your screen. Uh, so I'll let you walk this through what we're looking at. This is the application you've, you've built off of this, right? Yeah, this is an application that one of the developers of our team, uh, you know, worked on. And this is like sort of like our own little uh, application to experiment with more advanced tools that we're looking to introduce in the playground. But I quickly switched to this given our time so that I can show you what kind of responses uh, you can get with, with Code Interpreter. So it was the exact same, uh, um, you know, um, uh, question that I asked it, and you know, then it iterated with me. Said that you know, hey, do you want to use a CSV file? And it's it's really like interesting in the way that uh, it tries to problem solve with you, and uh, you know, tries to understand uh, you know in a lot of ways that what is it that you're looking to achieve. So in this, you know, it generated the top five revenue generating companies, and then asked you to create a bar chart. And Code Interpreter basically did this out of the box. I didn't have to like implement any separate plugin or anything. This is like all uh, uh, CI. And it gave me a link to download this file, uh, this image. And then I went on to ask it some uh, uh, mathematical questions, like giving me the correlation coefficient between revenue uh, and net profit, then asked it to increase the sample size. And I told me, tell me which sectors have a positive correlation. So think about it enabling potential use cases where let's say you're an investment analyst and you're trying to you know, bring together these different data insights to inform a portfolio strategy. So something like this can be really powerful when uh, you're trying to get indications and sort of like, uh, you know, to an extent, the recommendation of, you know, what is happening with your data in a very lightweight way. So the other examples is, um, there is this one uh, that, you know, is with the Microsoft stock price. And uh, the interesting thing is for this one, uh, we've implemented not just connecting to a finance API, but also through Logic Apps, we've linked it to my team's channel. So if I say that, you know, hey, please send this info to my team's channel, and it literally immediately is going to send it to my team's right away, and it just pops up as, as a notice, the pre-configured team's channel. So yeah, so I can, uh, I can switch my screen to show you, but essentially, uh, this is where I just sent it. All right, and I am, I am, the second I see Mona's screen, I'm gonna add it back in. I don't see any other questions in the chat. Thank you very much to everybody who's been participating in the chat. Uh, we wanna, uh, please feel free to keep those, those questions going. Um, I don't see the screen yet, but the second the screen pops yeah. up, I will, uh, I will add that in. Yeah, I am just trying to switch my screen. It's technical difficulty. No problem. Not sure what's happening here. Okay, so maybe I can go back to this and then oh. this link. Is it back? Yep. I, I was going to okay. say, I just re-added your screen. Oh, awesome. Okay, yeah, and then there's like some really cool implementation that I encourage everyone to try this out. You know, I've been working with the Fast Track team and, you know, uh, they've developed some really, really cool demonstrations, you know, of samples. And, and the things that you can do with this is what I'll say limitless, right? So when people ask me what are the use cases for Assistance API, I, I respond by saying, where does your imagination take you? Because if you think about GPTs and what's available, you know, like the portfolio of like the things you can do with GPT and the GPT store, it's basically anything. And Assistance API is built in a way that it provides the flexibility for you to be able to like implement anything that you want with some really powerful capabilities underneath. So I've, I've got a comment in here uh, from Bio Hong. I've been testing with this and it airs out on simple uh, small data sets. Are there any attempts to prevent the airing out? Um, and, and one of the first thoughts that I have is if we're, if we're getting errors on that, um, that's absolutely something where potentially we want to have a ticket open on that. So that way we understand yeah. what the errors are around that. And so that way we can, we can make sure that if there is any issue, we raise that up. I know that's a very common practice that we have. Um, but Mona, any guidance that you have for if people are getting errors on small data sets, uh, how to be able to work around that? Yeah, I, th I think that uh, we, we'd love to know, you know, what errors you're facing, but some common troubleshooting ideas here. So one thing to know is that we're seeing a lot of people, uh, uh, you know, look for uh, or try to execute retrieval type uh, queries so that, you know, like tell me what's in my data or, you know, sort of like the RAG implementation. So we don't support that yet. 
but if you're trying to uh, you know implement files with code interpreter and you're getting an error like one idea is uh, try to save the assistant before you try to execute it and try not to pause the run of uh, the assistant or try to like run it again instead of you know changing the configuration midway while the assistant is running and then sometimes it overrides uh, the instructions from the original run so that could be causing a problem but uh, you know if you can email us and I can I can share uh, you know the the support alias we'll be able to tell you better on what's going on but I would say with saying like uh, is, is your uh, use case related to code interpreter or were you trying to ask it something related to retrieval is where I would start yeah, to be along, one of the things I'd recommend is uh, we'll see if we can get an alias from Ono, but if nothing else, there should be a support option that you have within the Azure portal. Lift that up because the PG is going to want to hear from you. I know whenever we're working with a PG on a preview service, one of the key things that we want to make sure is that we've got a very open feedback loop um, with anything that we're seeing within the preview uh, practice. So we want to make sure that we we can find that out. There'll be some logs, some information that and telemetry that we can probably get. So that way we can really dig into that deep and, and make sure everything's operating the way it should. Um, thank you for the question, sir. Uh, Brian Ha, are there any implementation differences between Azure OpenAI Assistance API versus the OpenAI version? It is very similar as of today. Uh, the only thing that we're not supporting is the retrieval tool. But uh, everything else, uh, you know, around you know the Azure Enterprise Promises and Azure-related functionality, you know, is something you'll see, um, you know, in the future. But as of today, in terms of what you get from the product, it is pretty much the same. Yeah, and and Mo, I think that probably answers your question. Right now, the uh, the retrieval uh, is not yet supported, but that's on the roadmap. That's going to be here very soon. Uh, yeah. But if you are interested, again, let me mention uh, Microsoft Fabric. Uh, I, I've got many videos on there on how we're using uh, Microsoft Fabric to be able to uh, do rag pattern solutions, either with the semantic kernel. We've got some videos on LangChan, and then we've also been doing things just using the OpenAI Copilot co as well. Um, and then Azure Assistance also doesn't support the latest GPT model, correct, 0125. Um, I tell you what, we'll follow up on that. Yeah, Josh says bingo, thank you. Yes, I worked in Microsoft Fabric again. That's definitely a bingo. Uh, Mona, this was fantastic. I thank you so much. I know we're a little bit past the time, but I really wanted to get your demo in, and this, is, this has been absolutely wonderful. Is there anything that you wanted to cover uh, before I move on to, uh, I think, up next, I have, uh, uh, let's see, the demo walkthrough. Oh, no, sorry, customer engineering onboarding experience with Karen. No, I, I think we're good should to go. Okay, Alex. I'm going to. It should be Alex. Uh, Alex is a cool. Oh, is Alex next? That, I have. There should be also Alex, uh, cool demos from Alex. Yeah. Oh, okay. So I apologize. Uh, thank you. Thank you for catching me, Niraj. I'm sorry, Karen. Uh, <laughs> I was so eager to hear from you. Uh, that's okay. But coming up very soon. But first, we're going to go to Alex Morales. Alex, uh, you've got the uh, some personal finance scenarios that you're going to do. I, I'm absolutely fascinated on this. I am apparently going to supercharge my 401k um, after we get done with this by using the OpenAI assisted uh, API. Uh, so, so talk to me a little bit. What do we got here? So thank you, Bradley. Uh, I don't know if I can do justice to everything Mona said. I, uh, but I'm gonna try to showcase some of the, some of the concepts that she talked about. Um, here, the the way that I think that we can understand the the power of assistance is probably by starting with uh, an application that doesn't use assistance, and then comparing that same application against one that uses assistance. So in this simple application, I am going to take a very simple portfolio of investments, uh, a CSV file in the no assistance file. Uh, and sorry guys, I'm, I'm getting messages. I should have blocked that out. Anyways, um, and I am going to write, let me, uh, let me put myself on do not disturb. Just give me one second, please. No problem. And, and while we're doing that real quick, Mona uh, has hopped in the chat. Support for one for 0125 is coming up. Customers who have been using 1106 will be upgraded to 1025 in the next few weeks. 
Uh, and then retrieval support is coming up for rag patterns. So it's absolutely going to be in place. It is on our roadmap, and the, the PG is is working hard for that. Go, go ahead, Alex. All right. So um, basically, again, starting, uh, we have a simple portfolio. We're not using assistance. Here, I wrote this simple uh, Python uh, notebook. I, and I actually wanted to make a point here. I'm not using any libraries. I'm not using LangChain. I'm not using OpenAI. I am basically just going to execute a simple post to the completion endpoint of an API. And by the way, um, the, the assistance API is an extension to these APIs. And, and you can do things like create assistance, create threads, create users. But with that, I, I load a portfolio file. Again, we're in the no assistance scenario. And I write a prompt and I say, hey, you know what? I want to uh, extract the, um, the ticker symbols, the quantity and the price that I pay for those investments in an Excel output format. And then what would I have to do with it, right? I wanna create a calculation. I wanna say, well, now I need to find the latest price I need to, uh, you know, I need to get the latest price. I get the latest price. So I execute a function to get the latest price. I then go through some calculations. I build a table and I email that table. So this is kind of the output of, of that, right? Of, of, of doing that without assistance. Now let's take a look at the assistance scenario. The assistance scenario is actually very powerful because now it's like what Mona was saying, you are kind of, chatting with your data and, and you can do a lot more, you know, because you now have a, a thread uh, uh, of managed messages. You, you, you can have a very uh, complex conversation in this scenario. So what do I have to do? Um, I, I, now I'm working with, with the OpenAI uh, client. I'm no longer, you know, just executing a post requests. I prepare a function that is going to give me the latest stock prices with the Yahoo um, uh, package. I also have a function that sends emails. I'm using, in this case, logic apps. And then this is the preparation of the assistant, right? Uh, the assistant comes with several tools, including uh, what Mona was describing, code interpreters. So here, I gain the ability to perform uh, complex calculations. And then this assistant has two functions, one function to get stock prices, one function to send emails. Then I read my data file, the, the same portfolio file. And now here is the part where in my code, I create the assistant and I give it a name, I give it some initial instructions. I give it the tools that I am going to use. I give it the, the model that I am using and the files that I am gonna be working with. And notice that this is a list of files, it's not just one file, so it becomes multiple files. I also prepare a function that will handle when the assistant needs to invoke a function, this is the function that it will call. And if you see here, it's a, well, if the assistant needs to get the latest stock prices, this is how it will get the latest stock prices. If the assistant needs to send an email, this is the, 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 the function that it will call to send a, an email. Then I, because I'm working on notebooks, I wanna, I wanna format nicely the messages that I am getting back from the assistant. So the assistant, this is the, my, my function to format messages and here, of notice is that you can you can get text messages, but you can also get images. So you know how do you how do you get text messages and images from the assistant, right? Um, and then this is the function that actually gets the user the user's question. Um, it is not a full prompt because you're just sending a message, but in the end, you know you're executing a completion. And that completion is, again, like when Mona was explaining, you have a, this is amazing, right? You, you have the, the conversation, the thread is the conversation and the, and the message in the, in the thread are being managed for you. So um, now I can have a conversation with the assistant and here, based on that conversation, I can say, hey, well, based on the provided portfolio, what, what, what investments do I own? And here I get a list of my investments. What is in my portfolio? Uh, what is the value, I'm sorry, in my portfolio? Let's think about this question, right? The assistant has to think that it needs to get the latest stock prices, and then it has to go through each of those investments and then calculate the value of that investment. 
uh, then, you know, what is my best and worst investment? Here it has to tell me, you know, again, perform that calculation, do some comparison and tell me this information. And then here it's amazing, right? I say, well, can you chart a list of realized gain or loss of my investments? And it, it will do that. Um, and then in the end, I say, well, can you please email me uh, an HTML formatted report of, of, of this report? And, and the system here, you will say, hey, it's email sent to myself. And then I do some cleanup, um, you know, of, of this assistance. So hopefully this shows the kind of the power of assistance. And like what Mona was showing, um, you know, we've also created a, a similar in our team, a similar playground to the one that, that the team developed. And we really here, um, you can you can try out the same scenarios, you know, the finance scenario, the I have an energy scenario, a banking scenario, where you can ask questions. But if you think about it, it's really chat with your data, right? You give it a uh, many, many files, um, and and then the system can can start answering very smart questions I and mean, very intuitive questions about about your data. And with that, hopefully, I was able to show the, the power of assistance. Thank you, Bradley. Thank you, Mona. Very, very nice. Great stuff, Alex. All right. So um, I apologize. I'm, I'm moving windows around here so that way I can see where we're going. I, I believe up next I have Karen. Uh, so, Karen, I'm going to uh, switch over to you. Uh, and uh, please tell tell the good people out there if they want to engage with some of the wonderful team. Definitely not me, because as you can tell from all the questions I asked, I'm not as up to date on this as our wonderful other uh, people on the panel. But how would you uh, engage with us to be able to get some assistance if you're looking at building something with Microsoft? Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so as shared earlier, I'm a program manager on the Fast Track Azure team. And there are a few Fast Track organizations in Microsoft, but just to clarify, we're specifically targeted for Azure. Now, if you're interested in aborting the Assistant API, uh, we are one of the programs available through your account team. Um, so if you can go to the next slide. Let me see if I can do that here. So what is Fast Track? Uh, we're actually an advisory technical enablement program staffed with Azure engineers, such as the gentleman you've uh, seen here and program managers who work directly with customers on committed projects. And our goal is to empower customers to deploy new solutions and services. So what does empower mean exactly? Um, it's entirely advisory. It's really through the use of best practices, design principles, and tools to successfully manage Azure solutions. We also help customers feel more confident and knowledgeable about Azure. You know, Assistant API is new. It's, it's really nice to have someone who's done it before to kind of walk you through that. And finally, to accelerate the deployment of Azure solutions to production. So that is our, our charter and how we look to help customers uh, deploy. Now, we are complementary, but we do have a vetting process to ensure it's a right fit for the program. Um, so if you're interested um, to work with Fast Track, please know that FTA is here for you. So next slide here. Um, we've got a little bit on the um, Azure AI in a box. I know the team will talk about that later, but Fast Track can he he is here to help you deploy through that. So how do we get engaged? To rest, uh, request to get engaged, please work with your account team. Um, they're the best first stop to, to ensure that this is a good your project is a good fit for the program. I also have here a link, we'll drop it in the chat to other customer stories. Uh, of course, we help with Azure OpenAI Assistant API, but basically all everything under the sun that's GA, even a few items that's end of life, as well as preview, as in this case. And finally, putting a plug here for um, FTA Live, that's another option for people if you wanted to get to know Fast Track a little bit before actually engaging, uh, that's a nice option as well. And so that's it for me. Please let, you, let us know if you'd like to engage by going with your account team, and we're happy to help you walk through that process to deploy. Yay. Absolutely wonderful stuff. Awesome. Yeah, some, uh, I, I was going to say, a lot of people don't realize this, but it, we love to help people. It's part of what we do whenever we talk about this experience we get with customers to be able to give insights on the videos that we do. Um, this, this is where it's coming from. All right, so up next... Uh, I have uh, the man himself, uh, best beard in the business. That's right, uh, Mr. Andreas Padilla. Uh, so, Andreas, I, I was going to say I've got uh, you and Naraj, and I, I've got Naraj's screen. So I'm going to share this out, and I believe yes. both of you two are going through this, correct? 
share, share in Raj's screen. Uh, we wanted to take, we're going to get you to lunch. Okay. Just give me two minutes. We want to get you to lunch. We, Naraj, myself, and Alex, Karen, we've been working on the box now since September, October, you know, trying to get easy buttons. The name of the game here is easy buttons for, for customers. We want them to be able to be like, just get me an accelerator that deploys the whole thing in Azure. I want to know how all, you know, all, all the, the services interconnect, how they sing and dance together. And that's what we're doing here. That's the reason why we got AI in the box and we broke it up into four sections. Naraj. Do me a favor, scroll down, bring up that image. Thank you, my friend. We broke it up into four sections, ML in a box, okay? Well, our game plan there is to put Azure ML best practices accelerators in that box. Then you're gonna gravitate a little bit more, you're gonna evolve, you say, you know what? I wanna grab a model and I wanna put it everywhere. That's why we got Edge AI in the box. We're, we're, we have a nice accelerator for how to do a model and then deploy with Azure IoT Edge with custom vision. And then we're going to evolve that to incorporate AKS, AKS Edge. So watch out for that series. That series is going to get built out. It's a great series. Point of the game there is grab a model, deploy it anywhere. Um, it's also going to incorporate Azure Internet Operations, which is in preview. Watch out that. But just an FYI, uh, you know, Gen AI, those models are heavy. There's, there's a demand and there's going to be a way to get those that find how to get all that, find the intent, run those models on the edge. We want to showcase how to do that for you. Then now we're getting into the Cadillac, our, our major services, which is the AI services realm. Gene did a great post on how to do uh, video analysis with GPT. So watch out for how do you incorporate uh, GPT uh, with Video Indexer, with uh, optical character recognition. There's a lot of stuff coming up with GPT-4 and video. And video, we want to, we're going to put all that in the box. And now, the golden realm of it all, which is AOI in the box. That's where Alex has been helping us drive. Ramona has been helping us drive. All that good stuff, all the assistance API stuff is in there. Alex, you are a guru when it comes to all the open AI stuff that goes into the box. Watch out all for, uh, we're gonna, in a, in a week or two, we're gonna bring in the conceptual know-how because it's important to showcase to customers, you know, all these end-to-end -end solutions, but customers require, hey, going back and fine tuning a little bit of the concepts. What's chunking, what's embedding? Um, how do I use semantic, you know, or LangChain? Or, you know, all those little concepts that, you know, get lost in translation. All of that's in AI in the box. We're working on this. We're trying to get you all easy buttons. Anything I'm missing, Naraj? You're on mute, bud. Yeah, I, I was going to say Naraj is, is doing a Mr. Josh Ludeman. He is on mute. <laughs> uh, and now we, we see all of your screen. Oh, <laughs> one last you thing before up. Thank you to uh, uh, Chris Ayers, Victor Santana, Alex and his team, and Gene Hayes, Eduardo, all you guys. Thank you for all the work you guys have been doing. Fantastic work, everybody. Sorry, Nuraj, go ahead. No, nope, I mean, you covered up everything. Only thing that I uh, wanted to add, add also is the available guidelines, like responsible AI is there, security is there, scaling open AI. All of them are in this same repository. Excellent. Well, I, I was going to say thank you all so much. Uh, this is this is incredibly excited. When I heard that you guys had not only done this, but had already built this out with the product group, I, I was so excited about this when the product group approached us about doing a live stream. Again, super excited. I want to thank everyone who joined us today. Thank you all for the questions, uh, for making this great. Again, the video is posted at the exact same URL. So if you need to share it, share it with a friend. Uh, and hopefully we will have Mona back at some point in time to talk about things in the future. Uh, once again, this has just been a wonderful time. And I'm so glad I got to spend it with all of you. Naraj Bukhari, Andreas Padilla, Alex Morales, Karen Eckberg, uh, Mona Willen, Thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate the good one out there. Uh, stay tuned for the Azure Data Company Roundtable. We've got a lot of great stuff we're going to share on there. Uh, we will see you later. Uh, take care of everyone. Wake up.